Does this count as crushing the QQQ? 50% additional over five years? Maybe. How about this? We're looking at the chart for Ethereum against the QQQ, although you can't even see the QQQ. But this video isn't going to be about crypto or Ethereum. I do want to use it as a quick lesson, and then we're going to talk about the actual ETF. So you're looking at my crypto portfolio. I've been investing in crypto for about four years now, and I'm a long-term buy and hold kind of an investor because one of the things I learned over those four years is that you cannot consistently make a profit trading in and out of really any market. I first started dabbling around with Bitcoin in around October of 2017, buying and selling a thousand bucks here and there, really not making much of a profit at all. But eventually, about a month later, at an average price of nine, nine and a half thousand bucks, that's when I bought my first large sum of Bitcoin to hold long term. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, I lost a lot of money, but just on paper, I didn't sell. And that's because I knew what I was buying. I didn't buy this out of momentum. I mean, it's partly true. That's why I initially had eyes for this asset, but I took the time to understand what this asset was and I quickly became a believer in it. I invest in both Bitcoin and Ethereum, and these are some of the many benefits Ethereum offers. Banking for everyone, a more private internet, peer-to-peer -peer network, censorship resistant, dApps or decentralized applications on the Ethereum network. So I believe this asset has an immense future promise and utility even today. So in the beginning, I made a mistake by trying to trade in and out of the market. And then once I did buy, I quickly lost a lot of money because the momentum shifted on me. However, because I knew what I was buying and I was a full believer, this price action didn't matter to me because I was a long-term investor and I believed in the asset I was holding. So even when all this fear, uncertainty, and doubt was happening, I was able to sleep just fine at night because I loved holding Bitcoin and Ethereum. Now, I'm not trying to say you should never cut a losing position because you always have to factor in opportunity cost. All I'm trying to say is that what I've discovered over my investing career, especially in volatile markets like cryptocurrency, is one, you have to be a long-term investor. Trying to trade these markets, it's just not going to be effective for most people. And because of that, I'm not going to advocate that on my channel because you're gonna lose money. And Warren Buffett's number one rule is to never lose money. And number two is to always know what you're investing in and why. That's what allowed me to hold this long term because I knew that what I had was very valuable. And because of that, I was able to hold this asset during all the volatile up and down swings. And that's what ultimately positioned me to be able to fully profit from its more recent price actions. Okay, so now let's take those lessons we learned and apply it to the ETF that I think will continue in the future to crush QQQ. And this, of course, is IGV here in orange. And historically, looking in the past, over the past five years, it has outperformed the QQQ by a nice margin. But this isn't the reason why we're buying the asset. We don't buy assets because the chart goes up and to the right. We have to understand the actual investment. And when it comes to IGV, I think it's phenomenal. Even if in the short term, the momentum changes, the asset itself is quality. So this is the investment objective of IGV. So the iShares expanded tech software ETF seeks to track the investment results of an index composed of North American equities in the software industry. And that's pretty much it. The expense ratio is pretty modest. Let's take a look at the holdings to get a better idea of what's happening. So we see companies like Adobe, Microsoft, Salesforce, Oracle into it. And you're gonna notice these are all companies that are of course software based, but when it comes to the core of it, they all have digital products. And the beauty with digital products is they have very little to no marginal cost of replication. And for those of you that didn't study economics in college, what that means is the economies of scale for these kinds of business models are just way more favorable. And that's ultimately why I think this ETF is going to outperform most others in the next five to 10 years. Let me give you a little example of what I mean by all this. So on amazon.com, if you search for any product like dog leashes, for example, most of these listings are by third party sellers. So people that just sell on Amazon using it as a platform to sell their individual products. 
I've actually done this. It's called Amazon FBA, fulfilled by Amazon. And I sell two products myself on Amazon. So these businesses have a traditional business model, right? They source their product from a manufacturer, usually in China, and usually the same couple of suppliers, by the way. And then they import them to the US, they send them to an Amazon fulfillment center, and then they make a listing on amazon.com, and that's how they sell their product. There's two major issues with this. The first is there's very slim margins. You can see how competitive everything is. So for example, these two listings are almost identical. It's the same product. The dog leash is exactly the same, maybe different colors, and that's why we see bundles. So this one, they have a collapsible dog bowl, something to hold bags. This one's similar, and they do this to try and differentiate themselves and not compete solely on price. Although if you look at the price, they are definitely in fierce competition with one another. And because of that, they have very slim margins. It's a business model that requires a lot of upfront capital. You have to buy thousands of units in advance, which is risky, import it, send it to an Amazon warehouse, and then compete with a thousand other people doing the same thing. And I'm speaking from firsthand experience because I've done this with two separate products. Now, I also have a YouTube channel. You guys are watching it right now. And this is an example of a business model with a digital product. And the economies of it are completely different. And in my view, extremely more favorable. So it does take a lot of time to make each individual digital product, in this case, a video. However, it doesn't matter if one person views it or a million people view it. There's no additional cost of replication to me. In comparison to an Amazon listing, if 100 people watch this video, I don't have to then go to a supplier, buy another 100 units, ship it to Amazon, and have all that cost involved. Because of that, economically speaking, it is super efficient and never goes out of stock. I don't have to ship anything. I don't have to manage inventory and spend money on that. And anybody can consume it. And IGV is simply a collection of companies that all have this business model. So you can see why I'm so bullish on IGV. Now, in all fairness, QQQ is one of the best performing ETFs of the past decade. These are the holdings of the QQQ. And a lot of these companies do have digital products. So we can see PayPal, even Adobe is here. These are great companies. And I want to say that the QQQ is still a phenomenal investment. I think it's going to continue to be one of the better performing ETFs over the next decade. And something a little bit surprising is in terms of overlap between IGV and QQQ, they only have 16% overlap. That's a lot less than I would have thought. And if we come down on the chart, you can see a bit more insight on this. So this right here is IGV is overweight relative to QQQ. And we can see all these digital product company names, Salesforce, Adobe, Intuit, Zoom, Autodesk, Activision Blizzard, so on and so on. And then the inverse is over here, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, a lot of the big tech names. And then we have names like Nvidia and Tesla, which do have a lot of software components to their business, but they are reliant on physical product sales. And that just is an economic disadvantage, even though I love both these companies. And the last thing I wanna say on this is Apple, for example, which is the largest holding in the QQQ and the largest company in the world, they do have a significant hardware business, but more recently, as we can see in this green color as a percentage of their revenue, they've been focusing and really pushing services because they understand how advantageous of a business segment this is. In fact, if we get rid of iPhone revenue, iPad, Mac, and other, this is the growth of their revenue services over time. Think Apple TV, Apple Music. These are digital products that have subscription revenue model, which is even better. And they being one of the largest and most successful companies in the world is really focusing on and pushing their digital product sales. So that's my thesis on IGV. I think it's one of the better growth ETFs you can buy. It is going to be extremely volatile and in the future, I wouldn't be surprised if it does come crashing down for whatever reason, but we're not buying it because there's momentum behind it and because the line happens to be going up and to the right right now. We're buying this ETF because the underlying companies that it holds all have superior business models focusing on digital products, which have great economics of scale to them. And because of that, they have the potential to have outsized returns over the market over the next five to 10 years. But let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. If you're still watching and enjoyed, give the video a like, subscribe, all that YouTube stuff, and I'll see you in the next one.